Are we all good? Are we all good on Zoom? Thumbs up. Fantastic. OK, so right. So thank you very much for inviting me to um, talk about Mars. Um, obviously, the red planet. Uh, we'll find out why it's red uh, in a little bit of time. But um, this presentation is all about Mars and a little bit of its history and a little bit of its context. So hopefully you're going to find it. Uh, hopefully you're going to find it interesting. So, so Mars. Why Mars? Why is Mars interesting? Let's start with that. Um, he says, making sure. Well, um, Steve's already sort of shown us where Mars is in the sky, but I sort of took this shot from. Um, um, well, I probably pinched it from Google actually. <laughs> <laughs> because that's by far the easiest way to cheat. Um, and um, this is what Mars actually looks like in the sky to the naked eye. So it's a red dot in the sky. You're not going to see a globe or anything you know, absolutely fantastic like that. You're just going to see a dot. OK, uh, but it is very noticeably red. OK, so it does stand out quite a lot from uh, other, um, you know, other stars. Uh, it's very noticeably a planet. Planets don't twinkle in the sky. That's the other thing that's a, a very easy way to spot them. So um, bear that in mind uh, if you go out and have a look at it. Any um, astronomical app that you can download for your phone or your tablet on your PC will show you where Mars is. And uh, it's quite easy to spot. And it's, it's significantly bright, um, a very, very bright red, uh, orangey sort of um, dot in the sky. So that's, that's kind of what it looks like from the Earth without any telescopes or binoculars or anything like that. Okay. Mars is named after the Roman god of war. So this was actually quite a nice image that I found of the Roman god of war. Um, so Mars is, um, you know, the, the colour was sort of symptomatic of blood. Um, you know, red, blood, war, um, fairly easy connection to make. And that's why uh, Mars is named uh, as it is. Uh, there is, as far as we know, no blood on Mars. <laughs> um, it is a, um, you know, it's, it's just the coloration. It was very, very obviously um, uh, a very uh, you know, bright red object in the sky, which made it very distinct from all the other objects you could see in the ancient sky. Um, and they named it after uh, the Roman god of war, hence Mars. And that's that's basically where that comes from. Now, um, we couldn't go too far without mentioning the obvious, so I'm going to just start. Um, I've got special effects here, courses here of a keyboard as well, so my people on my Twitch stream will be very familiar with this. Um, and so there's obviously, I've need just, I just need to play a few chords. It's got to be done, okay? It's got to be done. We've got to get that out of the way at the start because you knew it was coming. You knew it was coming somewhere along the line. <laughs> but there we go. So um, um, this is obviously Mars features hugely in science fiction, okay? He features hugely in science fiction. And um, one of the um, most famous tales, of course, is the War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. And um, he um, postulated that there were very advanced creatures living on Mars and that they basically had a dying planet and they were coming to Earth to pinch our stuff. And they basically came to Earth and decided to wipe out humanity. Um, landing, of course, as we all would in Woking, uh, which is obviously the epicenter of, of humanity. <laughs> if you've ever been to Woking, actually, there is a statue of a Martian fighting machine in Woking town centre. Uh, not a, not an, an actual working one, I hasten to add. <laughs> so no need to be feared. But um, yeah, you can actually go and visit a real fighting machine. It's not it's not that big, actually. It's not all that threatening. But if you're ever in Woking, and there aren't that many reasons to go to Woking, let's be honest, but that's one reason that it is worth going to Woking for, OK? Uh, there is a Martian fighting machine in the town centre at Woking High Street. <laughs> so there we go. Um, uh, maybe, I'm not sure, yeah, maybe it's decommissioned or maybe it's just, yeah, broken down or something. You know, I can't get the parts, etc., etc. There we go. Maybe it's waiting to be activated. Now, we can blame all of these stories on one man, OK? This is Percival Lowell. Now, he was an American chap who um, um, worked out of um, the United States in Arizona uh, in the early 20th century. And this, this is an image of him. And this is an image of his telescope, OK? The telescope that he used to study Mars uh, in around sort of 1910 onwards. And he thought, um, he thought he could see through this telescope an advanced, or at least evidence of an advanced um, civilization. So this is the Flagstaff um, Arizona Observatory. I went to visit this three years ago. It's a very impressive telescope. Um, 
you know, by you know early twentieth century standards, it's 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 not impressive technically by today's standards, obviously. But for for the time, it was pretty good. Okay, this is a large telescope with a lot of equipment on it. You know, beautifully set up and and well engineered for the period. Um, one thing I particularly like, I don't know if you can spot this in the right hand photograph, um, but there are some wheels. I don't know if the mouse shows up on the screen here, but if it does, there's a wheel there. Um, and there's another one there. The entire dome is suspended on these wheels. And I was looking at them thinking, they look like car wheels and tires. And, and I asked the curator of the um, observatory, I said, what are those? And he said, yep, they're 1920s Chevrolet, uh, uh, Chevrolet uh, wheels. <laughs> they're not specially designed. We just pinched them off nearby cars and used that to suspend the roof. <laughs> So there's a little bit of trivia for you, is that the entire roof of that observatory is actually on car wheels. Now, Percival Lowell thought he was seeing things on Mars. He thought he was seeing canals. This is what he thought on the left-hand side he thought he was seeing. So he saw all the areas of Mars. And, he, and, and you know, there are light and dark areas on Mars. You know, that is absolutely true. But straining to the limit of eyesight on the, tele the, the telescopes at the time, um, he was led, unfortunately, on a flight of fancy. And while some of the areas that he identified do actually exist, you can see here a sort of side-by-side -side shot of an actual photograph of Mars taken much more recently, and um, Percival Lowell's maps. He thought he was seeing canals connecting these sort of things up, straight lines, intersections, highways, and all sorts of things like that going on. And he deduced that the civilization on Mars was funneling water down from the polar ice caps to irrigate land, you know, in the in the in the more temperate zones and across the equator. That's what he assumed was happening. Nobody really dared to contradict him because he was quite an eminent um, astronomer of his time. And so the canals on Mars became a fixture of, of proper scientific literature for a long, long time. Um, what he actually saw is not entirely clear, whether it was imperfections in the telescope, whether he actually had some, um, you know, possibly a slightly detached retina in his eye, um, or he had, um, you know, sometimes you can even see these effects by the little... Um, the floaters that you get in your um, in your eyes when you're straining at certain you know, magnifications, various things, things. For whatever reason, he saw these things. He repeatedly felt he saw them, and he wrote them down and turned them into maps. Alas, none of these things exist at all. <laughs> so it was a complete flight of fancy, but it stayed around for a long, long time, uh, and it was so prevalent that the Daily Telegraph ran a competition for proof of extra intellig extraterrestrial intelligence beyond the Earth. But in the small print, it specifically excluded Mars because they said Mars would be way too easy. Um, so that sort of shows you how prevalent um, the, you know, the, the, the idea that, well, there's obviously life on Mars, you know, yeah, it's a given um, early on in the 20th century. It was just assumed that there was. And um, it wasn't until much later on that it became apparent that uh, unfortunately at least this kind of life wasn't there so um, a bit sad so the canals of Mars have long gone and long disappeared um, so there we go right so this is this is sort of <laughs> this is what the uh, uh, the artists and the romantists if you like thought that they hoped to see on Mars there'd be these beautiful crystal cities um, and these these wonderfully manicured canals that the Martians would sort of be boating up and down um, and Mars would obviously be red, but it would it would be beautiful. It would have weird and wonderful plants and um, all sorts of things like that. So um, this is this is what we assumed Mars would be looking like. And of course, it tells us much more about ourselves than it does about the real um, uh, environment of Mars. Um, you know, there's, there's this sort of hope for utopia once again. There's you know, clearly no pollution. The sky is clear and the city is beautifully constructed with no, no problems at all. So <laughs> very, very utopian sort of uh, expectation of what Mars was like. Alas, Mars is not like that. Mars is not like that. So um, there we go. Now, just to put Mars a little bit in perspective. So um, Mars is a lot smaller than the Earth. OK, Mars is a lot smaller. Um, the surface gravity is only 30 percent that of the Earth. So if you were you know, on Mars and jumped around, you would not have you know, the same um, constriction that you do on the Earth. It's not nearly as 
lightweight as the moon, which is only sort of point, um, 0.16 of the Earth's gravity, but Mars is not very much, okay, 0.3. And you can see that from its relative size. Mars is a lot smaller than the Earth. Uh, and that's had big impacts on Mars. The size of Mars um, has dictated how, how it's evolved over the, you know, over the millennia uh, and the billions of years since it was formed. Um, you can see it does have a few things in common. It does have an atmosphere, um, unlike you know, our moon, for example. Um, but the atmosphere is nowhere near as thick as what we have on the Earth. It's not composed of the same chemicals either. Mars' atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide and it's very, very thin. In fact, if you stood at the top of Mount Everest on the Earth, where, where you would absolutely very much struggle to breathe, um, that's still hundreds of times more dense than the Martian atmosphere at surface level. So um, whilst we say Mars has an atmosphere, it's not an atmosphere that us humans could do a great deal with. So you'd still need a pressure suit to stand on the surface of Mars. Um, you'll notice there, the, uh, what, is a, what is the South Pole? There is an ice cap. So the ice cap of Mars, uh, they, it's got a North Pole and a South Pole ice cap. And uh, that is a combination of frozen water, but also uh, frozen carbon dioxide. And uh, it gets quite cold on Mars, um, you know, such that uh, carbon dioxide can freeze. Uh, naturally on the surface. Uh, that doesn't happen on the Earth. <laughs> it doesn't get that cold. Um, but it's also partly to do with the pressure on Mars because the pressure is so low. Uh, so there's a few um, various bits and pieces around like that that make Mars a very different place to the Earth today. Mars's orbit is um, takes two of our years to go round the Sun. So uh, we see Mars every time we catch it up on an orbit. So every second year we can see Mars from the Earth easily. Uh, every in-between year, uh, Mars is on the opposite side of the Sun to us, so we can't see it at all. So Mars is always a feature every second year uh, in our skies. Now, um, obviously we went off exploring, or well, we tried to go and have a look at Mars. Now, the Russians, as they, as, as they did with many, many um, you know, space exploration things, kind of got there first. So uh, they did... Um, try and get to the moon first and in many ways they did quite a lot of stuff on the moon before the Americans did. They didn't do some of the really big stuff uh, as much but um, they were trying alongside um, you know post the you know post the moonshot times um, the uh, Russians were trying quite hard to get to Mars. Now getting to Mars is very difficult okay it's a long long way you know you think I think the moon is a long way the moon is you know peanuts. <laughs> He says, badly misquoting um, Douglas Adams there. Um, but um, yeah, Mars is a lot, lot further away, OK? And uh, a spaceship going to Mars um, has to start off from Earth and go in an expansive orbit in order to get to Mars. And it takes, um, you know, 12 to 18 months just to get to Mars because of the distance and because of the speed that you need to achieve in order to, to get to Mars. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. And of course, back in the 70s, when we started doing this, um, we didn't have the same kind of technology and computer power as we do today to allow us to predict things. So a lot of this stuff was, um, you know, quite hard to do. And it was done with slide rules and very, very primitive calculators and stuff like that. So um, the fact that they anybody actually <laughs> <laughs> got close to Mars uh, with the technology of the 60s and the 70s is actually quite impressive, I think. Um, but um, as you can see from this list, uh, a bit of a, a bit of a patchy track record. So Mars 1M was lost in space. OK, that's not the, um, you know, Angel Will Robinson. It's not that one. Uh, just literally lost in space. They don't know where it went. It's out there somewhere traveling around the sun. Uh, Mars 1 followed this up and got lost in space as well. Uh, Mars 2M exploded on the launch pad. Uh, so not going well so far. Mars 2 was the first successful, well, sort of successful probe. It got to Mars and crashed, OK? So technically, Mars 2 was the first Earth um, device that reached Mars. Unfortunately, it reached Mars at a very high speed and didn't survive the impact. Um, but that was November 1971, when I was one year old. So I, <laughs> that, shows you, that shows you how long ago it was, OK? Um, Mars 3 was the first... Um, um, uh, Earth uh, sent probe that actually managed a soft landing on Mars. Um, it wasn't able to do much, unfortunately, when it got there. <laughs> what they were able to confirm was, yes, it had arrived. <laughs> so, um, you know, hurrah for the, for, for the Soviet Union. Um, Mars 4 missed Mars. 
Um, it got in the general vicinity of Mars but failed to get into orbit and carried off into the solar system. Um, Mars 5 orbited Mars and actually sent back some photographs. And this was the first time that we actually got some close-up pictures of Mars. Uh, Mars 6 crashed on the surface but did send a little bit of data back about what the atmosphere is made of. Um, and it was actually, it crashed because they got the descent wrong because they assumed some things out of the atmosphere um, that were incorrect. And of course, had they have had the data from the probe before it landed, that would have been really, really useful. But unfortunately they didn't, so hence it crashed. But at least they had the data for the next time round. Uh, so they followed that up with Mars 7, which alas, unfortunately missed as well. And that's floating around the solar system somewhere too. So there are a lot of probes out there that went to Mars and missed and can now effectively space drunk and traveling around the solar system. So uh, keep an eye out for those just in case. OK, so those are the sort of things. So um, so that was that was the, the Soviet Union. That was what the Soviet Union was doing. Now, the Americans were you know, not wanting to be upstaged by this. You know, we're, we're going to go out there, too. Um, now, um, you may be looking at the second hand. I mean, there's, there's two mariners missing at the top of the list. Um, the, the American space flight program went to Venus and Mars with the same set of technology. So Mariners 1 and 2 went to Venus. So we're not counting them on here because obviously this talk is about Mars. Um, so Mariner 3 was the first American spacecraft to go to Mars and it exploded on launch. <laughs> uh, Mariner 4 um, did the first successful flyby of Mars. Um, um, some people say the Americans were attempting to go into orbit with this one and they got it wrong. So they claimed it was a flyby. Um, <laughs> we're not entirely sure about that one. But um, anyway, it went near Mars. It didn't go into orbit about Mars. Mariner 6 and 7 flew past Mars and took some photos, but again, didn't go into orbit. Uh, Mariner 8 exploded on the launch pad, alas. Um, and Mariner 9 was the first satellite to go into orbit around Mars in November 1971. So you can see there was a sort of almost like a secondary space race going on here um, with um, with the with the Soviet Union and and, uh, and America. They were still being very competitive with each other in the in the early 70s to try and get to Mars. Um, so yes, <laughs> flyby. I'm, I meant to do that. Yeah. <laughs> You know when you have a cat, you must know this Emma and Jason, you know when you have a cat and it falls off a chair or something that unexpected and it sort of stands up and goes, yeah, that, that's what I meant to do, you know, that's exactly what I think happened here. So there we are. <laughs> right, now you might be thinking, why were these scientists so keen on going to Mars? And I think, well, I think I've discovered the reason. <laughs> So um, this is this is uh, Edna Rice Burroughs and, and a selection of um, cover art across the years of the various different types of um, cover. Um, and Mars is obviously um, full of princesses and, 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 and ladies of, of virtue that need rescuing by um, by stalwart gentlemen of the time. So this is this is clearly why the scientists were, were keen to get to Mars, I think. <laughs> So Edna Rice Burroughs um, wrote a lot of science fiction about Mars. It has been turned into a film as well, uh, which is not brilliant, but you know, hey, it's a bit of a bit of popcorn fun. But Mars has featured dramatically in the science fiction of the period. So um, you know, that seems to be there's a big draw. There's a big sort of romanticism about Mars, which even exists today. But when we actually started getting real pictures of Mars, we um, first we had some some serious problems actually. So the Mariner probes, uh, for which we have the pictures from, um, had um, had some serious problems when they arrived in Marsh, uh, Martian orbit. Mars is beset by occasional um, dust storms, which actually envelop the entire planet. And as luck would have it, or as unluck would have it, when our first series of space probes turned up at Mars, there was a global dust storm. And so the first pictures of Mars showed absolutely nothing of interest whatsoever. <laughs> so they were a little bit concerned by this because they knew that the, the Mariner probes only had a certain lifespan. Uh, they were going to last for so long. And all the pictures that came back basically showed a completely featureless globe. It's looked, yeah, and you, know, you can just imagine the NASA guys going, we went to Mars, right? It wasn't, well, this isn't Venus. No, no, this is definitely Mars, but it looks like Venus. <laughs> so the pictures came back and they were, they were effectively blank. Um, and, you know, some consternation here. And then, you know, Mars has been beset by this global dust storm. Now, the probes were la launched uh, many, many months before because you have to launch them at particular launch windows in order to get them to Mars. And there was no dust storm when they set out. It was just really unfortunate that when the probes arrived, there was a global dust storm. 
Um, and so, you know, here's, an, here's another one. Um, and there's virtually nothing to be seen at all. Uh, this is a picture of Mars taken by one of the Mariner probes. And if you let your eyesight adjust, you may or may not be able to see this on your screen. You can just make out some splodges on the screen here, here, and here. And these are the peaks of three of the extinct Martian volcanoes. Um, and this is, in fact, over here, this is what we now know is, is Olympus Mons, the biggest volcano in the solar system. But this is, this is all they got. Uh, and the initial pictures coming back from the Mariner probes because the planet was blanketed in dust. But slowly the dust settled and there was some consternation and not a little disappointment when the images of Mars that came back showed a barren, cratered landscape, um, very like, apparently very like the moon in sort of general feel and form. Um, which was not what they were expecting at all. Um, you know, the old canals and the, you know, there must be life on, life on Mars, surely, you know. These pictures instantly completely wiped out that lovely romantic view of Mars as an interesting, dynamic, kind of Earth-like-ish planet. The fact that there are massive craters on Mars, and as you can see in many of the pictures, craters within craters, um, means that this, at least this part of the surface of Mars is extremely old and it hasn't been weathered away. Um, so instantly you can look at this and go, this, this, this piece of Mars is geologically inactive. Um, it hasn't been weathered by rain, it hasn't been weathered by plants, it hasn't been weathered by atmospheric erosion, um, and it hasn't been affected by plate tectonics or any of the processes on Earth that quickly wipe out um, craters. Um, that's why there aren't many craters visible on the Earth, because our planet basically destroys them very, very quickly in, the, in a matter of a, you know, a few hundred thousand years. The fact that they exist on Mars was immediately indic indicative that Mars was nowhere near as, as active as we kind of hoped it would. So Mars is, is, is cratered, um, very much like the Moon, at least in these particular pictures here. So the first shots were greeted with quite a lot of surprise and not a little bit of disappointment. They were, you know, the, the crystal cities and the canals were gone. <laughs> um, and Mars appeared to be a barren, featureless wilderness, rather like the Moon, just a bit redder and with a very thin atmosphere. And this was, this was quite a surprise to, um, you know, to the scientists who were looking at this stuff for the first time. Um, now, we got a bit more serious, well, at least the Americans did, okay? So the Americans went back to Mars in 1975 with a, with a fantastically sophisticated, for the time, spacecraft combo called Viking, which was an orbiter, as you can see, and a lander that was designed specifically to go and search for life. Uh, the lander had a number of experiments on board uh, that was designed to try and detect the traces of life, um, and confirm or deny whether or not there were any sort of microbes living on the surface of Mars still. Because the idea, um, after, you know, after those initial pictures, quite a lot of thinking had been done, and the assumption was therefore, okay, well, there can't be any big advanced forms of life on Mars that you know, just isn't possible given what we now know. But is there microbial life? Could there be you know, very, very small stuff living in the soil still um, that might be alive? And Viking was sent to go and find out. Viking, of course, did discover life. So here is a Martian life form standing beside the Viking. Uh, actually, no, sorry, that's Carl Sagan. <laughs> um, this is <laughs> this is Carl Sagan. Um, um, you know, who, who's kind of my hero, actually, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan is 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 you know the guy I wanted to be. Um, he's standing beside the Viking land to give it a bit of scale. This is actually, I think, in Death Valley, where they um, where they where they were testing. Um, Viking and you can see the general construction of the of the lander um, this thing here is obviously the radio uplink um, these are fuel tanks on the side uh, this um, thing with a, a stripe on it is actually the camera um, they were not digital cameras in the sense that we have digital cameras today these took striped images of the surface a bit like the old school pictures it would take a single stripe then move take a single stripe then move take a single stripe then move and then it would send back the entire picture um, as, a, you know, as a series of data streams. So by modern technology, extremely primitive camera, but it's the best that we could miniaturize and send to Mars at the time. Very, very advanced. And it had loads of little experiments on board to try and determine 
whether or not there was actually life on Mars. And it would have a scoop that would deploy, as you can see here. It would dig a little trench in Mars. It would scoop up some soil, put it back into this laboratory and subject that soil to various experiments. And one of those experiments was to warm the soil up a bit, stick some glucose syrup effectively into the soil and see if it could detect um, um, oxygen or carbon dioxide being um, given off by the soil in response to the warming and the glucose. So the idea being, give the microbes some food, uh, warm them up a bit and see if they give off, if basically if they respire in some way. You know, quite an elegant test. And surprise, surprise, um, the result came back positive. The result came back positive. And everyone was incredibly excited. Well, yeah, the, the, yeah, the Martian soil is, um, is, is respiring. There, are definitely, there must be microbes in the Martian soil. Um, now, that was very exciting for a few months until they started looking a little bit more into the chemical composition of, of Mars and realized that Mars's surface is a very strongly reducing environment. And if you add anything to it, it's likely to give off oxygen. Um, uh, and, and carbon dioxide in response to kind of almost any provocation. <laughs> so it may have detected some microbes, but it certainly isn't definitive proof. Now, Viking wasn't able to move around, okay? So it, it landed where it was and it took pictures and that's all it could do. And two Viking probes were sent um, and they sent back the first pictures of Mars. And this is one of the first pictures that was issued to the press. And uh, everyone went, wow! That looks amazing. The surface of Mars is full of rocks and there's a lovely blue sky and um, that, that looks incredible. Until it transpired that they'd sent the photograph down to their labs without any reference markers on the coloration. And so they processed it and thought, well, that looks a bit strange. It's all red. So we're going to process it so it makes it look proper. So they basically altered the color balance and made the sky look blue. Um, so when that unfortunately got out to the press before um, NASA was able to correct it because it should have looked like this. So the one on the left is actually the true colour image of Mars and the one on the right is the one that's been artificially corrected to look like it's come from Earth. <laughs> so m the Martian sky is a sort of salmony pink colour most of the time. The, the, the sky that you're seeing on the right hand side is not the actual colour of Mars that you would see at this, uh, at this latitude at this time of day. So, um, so Mars is a sort of salmony um, pink colour on the surface, um, and it's um, you know it's quite different to the Earth. What you can see there um, is obviously a lot of rocks. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there's you know a lot of scientific stuff that can be done with this image in terms of you know the size of the rocks and the distance of the rocks and all those sort of things, and the nature of the rocks and various other bits and pieces. Now I'm not a geologist; I can't tell you about it. I do know this is a um, a lava plain. Um, and, and most of these rocks are to do with, um, you know, they, they have a kind of um, semi-volcanic origin uh, in the fact that they're strewn across in a way that's going on like this. And that's where one of the Viking probes landed. Uh, they were actually, um, unfortunately, in some way, the Viking probes had to land in boring places. I remember Carl Sagan, uh, <coughs> Carl Sagan being very clear about this. Is we, we had to land in boring places because... Um, we couldn't, A, we couldn't move, but we, we had basically had to guarantee that we could land. And we wanted flat, dull, boring places to make sure that our Viking um, you know, spacecraft could actually land at, you know, with the hope of landing safely. Um, they did want to go to some of the really exotic places, but they said the chances of the Viking lander actually surviving the landing uh, were much, much lower. And it was deemed too much of a risk to the mission. So they had to land in uh, relatively boring places, uh, which were uh, the, the main thing being that they were flat. Um, hence, they you know they landed in these these kind of out of the way locales uh, as the first foray onto the Martian surface. So Viking did teach us a lot about Mars, but the big questions still unanswered. And Viking couldn't move, so uh, it was down. It could look around, it could sample what was close by, and that was it, that's basically what it could do. So um, it took a long time for us to go back to Mars. Okay, it took a long time. We were busy with space shuttles and um, the ISS in the intermediate time. It wasn't until 1997 that we sent another lander back to Mars. Um, and the Sojourner rover is, is a very, very famous little, um, you know, kind of, it's, it's almost a toy, actually, in some ways. It was the first rover on Mars. So this was a little, um, little um, contraption that could move around under its own power, uh, solar powered, uh, and it could move around. It could basically tap rocks with a little hammer and 
drill into things and have a look and, and do some kind of on-site science. Quite limited, but there was sort of a proof of concept for later missions. Can we send a rover to Mars and get it to drive around? And the answer was yes. So it was a sort of a... Um, uh, very famous. Uh, it didn't last too long, but it proved that we could send a rover to Mars and that it would actually work. Um, the other one that went around about the same time was the first sort of high resolution camera to orbit Mars. So this is Mars Global Surveyor. That went in 1997 as well. This wasn't a lander, this was in orbit, um, but it gave us our first high resolution imaging capability of the Martian surface. And this started showing up some more interesting things. Uh, it showed that there were water-like um, artifacts on Mars, as if um, things had been carved by running water at some point in the dim and distant past. So you can see sinuous rills and strange escarpments and curving river bends, you know, completely barren and devoid of water today, but um, potentially, f um, you know, carved by water in the past. And the question is, was that true? Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that uh, the Global Surveyor was able to help us with is much, much higher resolution images of the entire surface of Mars. Um, in fact, we have better coverage of the surface of Mars today than we do the Earth's surface if you take the whole of the Earth's surface into account. Because obviously, because a lot of the Earth's surface is covered in water, we don't have high resolution maps of the ocean floor at the moment. Um, but we do have high resolution maps of the entirety of Mars, which puts a little bit of context for it. <laughs> it shows you how difficult it is to image the bottom of the ocean. Uh, you can't obviously do it from space in the classic sense. Um, Mars doesn't have any oceans, and um, therefore you can see the entirety of the surface of the planet using optical wavelengths, which makes for nice pictures, um, which again contrasts with Venus, because you can't see into Venus at all. You have to do that by radar. Um, which is it's nowhere near as high res as optical imagery can be. And optical images are always nicer, I think, because you know, that's the sort of stuff that you would see if you were in orbit yourself. Um, radar images give you kind of the structure, but they don't really tell you what it looks like. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the thing. Um, now, the, the British, uh, <laughs> huzzah! <laughs> the British, we had a space program too, to go to Mars. We went to Mars in 2003 and we crashed. <laughs> there was a special episode of um, uh, a TV series, a, a, new, a satirical news TV series called Have I Got News For You? And on that TV show, the question was posed, when will we know that Beagle 2 has got to Mars then? Um, to which um, Paul Merton quipped, well, when we lose contact with it, obviously. <laughs> so, alas, um, the British space programme started and stopped with Beagle, Beagle 2 uh, in 2003, but... But everyone lampooned this, this spacecraft. Um, you, know, you know, the British tried, and obviously they're going to fail because they're British and they can't do anything properly in terms of space. And it was done on a budget, it was done on the cheap, and it wasn't properly funded, and all those things. But, but, we can reveal the end of the story. It didn't crash. It didn't crash. Okay, it did land successfully. Um, unfortunately, uh, it appears not to have deployed properly. So it did soft land on Mars. You can see in this image, this is very low, uh, this is really straining, the, and the Americans, bless them, took this picture for us um, from the previously mentioned um, uh, imaging camera, uh, showing that Beagle 2 did in fact touch down on Mars. It unfolded two of its solar panels, but it appears that two of the solar panels didn't unfold correctly. Um, and unfortunately what that means is that all of the solar panels have to unfold for Beagle 2 to have put up its antenna and contact the mothership. So because those two solar panels didn't unfold for presumably either they were slightly damaged on landing or there was simply a mechanical fault, um, Beagle 2 did soft land but it wasn't able to put out its antenna so it wasn't able to radio home that it was, um, it was online. Uh, it probably did do some science while it was there uh, it may have gathered some data. It, it certainly would have gathered data on the way down. Uh, and that data is in the solid state memory of the machine. So um, with a bit of luck, at some point in the dim and distant future, somebody will be able to go to Beagle 2 and uh, you know, plant a little British flag <laughs> next to it going, huzzah. Because it did land. I mean, I think I think it's important for for the British British psych to realise that we didn't. We almost we almost had a success, but unfortunately not quite. So um, no, it didn't crash. So that's that's a persistent myth that is now crushed. It's been found. It's on the surface of Mars, but unfortunately it didn't work. 
So we need we need Beagle Three. We need to go back and do it again this time. You know, make sure we get a proper British flag down there. So, so there we go. Um, so um, back to the Americans, of course. So the Americans are getting into into, into proper high gear now. Uh, Mars exploration rovers Spirit and Opportunity. Um, both of these uh, were supposed to last only a few months on the surface of Mars. And as you can see, um, Spirit lasted for six years, which is pretty good if you've only designed it for a few months. Um, but Opportunity was running up until two years ago. Uh, so this, this little rover was driving around the surface of Mars uh, and it did kilometers. You can see from the map how far it went. Um, it lasted for 14 years. <laughs> so that's proper over-engineering. So um, there's, there's two ways to look at this. Isn't that a fantastic piece of engineering? which is the engineer's viewpoint. There's also the bean counter's viewpoint is that we spent way too much money on that probe. <laughs> and it lasted way longer than it should have done. Um, so it's obviously been, you know, we, we can cut back on the budget for future probes. We don't need to make them that good. Uh, so, um, but anyway, an amazing achievement to have these probes, um, you know, these little rovers driving around and doing proper science for so many years. Um, and they had all sorts of problems because the Martian soil gets into the wheels and it clogs things up and all sorts of bits and pieces like that makes it very hard to um, uh, maneuver and, and at, towards the end apparently Opportunity was dragging two of its wheels across the Martian surface it, they had seized and so the other four wheels were sort of grinding forward you can see this little probe limping on <laughs> I'm going to get to the next crater. And uh, it was sort of dragging itself across the Martian surface, still still doing 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 science yeah, right until the end. Um, and unfortunately, what happened, what killed these probes off eventually was that um, um, dust accumulates on the solar panels, which prevents them from charging properly. And obviously the onboard batteries decay over time as well. So alas, both of those stopped communicating with us and they are now derelict on the surface of Mars, but um, they went for a long, long time. We got a lot more science out of them than we expected to. So really, really impressive bit of engineering there as well. Um, now, um, Curiosity rover is still there. OK, so this is the, the current rover that's actually operating on the surface of Mars. This has proper, decent high res cameras. It even has a microphone so you can listen to sounds on the surface of Mars. It has uh, mass spectrometers. It has magne magneto measurement devices. It has all sorts of, of cool stuff. It even has a laser beam so it can shoot rocks and stuff. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a very cool piece of tech, OK? And it's wandering around Mars doing science even as we speak. Um, and that landed in 2012. It's still going. So that one's a good piece of tech as well. It's been running around for eight years. It's still got a few bit more life left in it as well. Uh, it's an amazing thing. Now that is actually quite big. Now just to give you a sense of the scale of these rovers. So down here, this is the original Sojourner rover, which looks like a kind of remote controlled car. OK, so that's the sort of size it is. Spirit and Opportunity were quite a lot bigger. But look at the size of um, Curiosity by comparison. It's enormous. It's the same size as a car. Um, and it weighs about the same as a very small car, OK? And that's basically what the, the Americans managed to land on the surface of Mars. And it came down with, um, you know, parachutes and then it had a descent stage with retro rockets and thrusters. And it was, it was very cool. I'd love to have seen it actually land. It would have looked awesome. It would have scared the living daylights out of any Martians that happened to be wandering around at the time um, as this thing barrels in, drops things, explodes and then lands in a big, big cloud, cloud of sort of smoke and steam and then basically starts lasering things with its laser eye. Um, but um, fortunately, there are, as far as we know, no, um, no Martians around to actually see that sort of stuff. So, um, but that gives you an idea of how big these things are. So the, um, the um, Curiosity rover is an enormous, enormous beast of a, of, a, of a space probe rovering around on the surface of Mars. Mars is, in fact, um, unlike the Earth, which obviously is inhabited by humans, Mars is the only planet known in the galaxy to be in completely 100% inhabited by intelligent machines. <laughs> so that may give you pause for thought. <laughs> as far as we know, the only planet in the galaxy inhabited by intelligent machines. So there we go. Um, now, they, uh, the, the Americans aren't stopping. You know, so there's more stuff, more good stuff coming. And they're not the only people going back to Mars, actually. So in-flight missions, this is stuff that's already on the way. So they left this year. They'll arrive early in 2021. So the Hope Auditor from the, uh, the UAE um, they're going there to study Martian weather. Uh, Taiwan, uh, Tianwen One is from China, so the first Chinese Martian, Mars, yeah, Mars mission. Uh, they're sending an orbiter, a lander, and a rover to Mars to go and do some science. 
Um, and then the Americans are sending a sort of upgraded Curiosity rover called Perseverance, which has um, it's sort of a, a sort of souped-up Curiosity. It's got more power, um, yeah, better wheels, and um, yeah, more sciencey stuff on board. So yeah, that's that's on its way to Mars as we speak as well. So that's that's we're looking forward to what that can actually achieve. And even better, this is and this is very exciting. I think they're sending a helicopter. So um, they're sending a helicopter to Mars. So the Curios uh, the Perseverance rover will have in its kit bag of things it can deploy a hovering drone, uh, which can fly around on Mars and take pictures and, and do stuff and you know sort of take aerial pictures of, of Mars and fly to places that are a bit more inaccessible to the rover. So it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what that can do. Um, and you know the engineering challenges of of the of making a flying machine that will work in the Martian atmosphere are not to be underestimated, okay? So you, we've already talked about the atmosphere being really, really thin, and you've got to design a flying machine that will work uh, autonomously, because of course, Mars is so far away, even at its closest, it takes a radio message 20 minutes to get there and 20 minutes to get back. So you can't, you can't, you can't remote control your drone. <laughs> <laughs> on Mars from Earth, that's not going to work. Um, so the, the the drone has to be totally AI driven in order to carry out its tasks. So um, some amazing tech has been has been put into that. So um, and um, they also want to potentially um, grab some samples and and bring these sort of things home, or at least prep them for bringing home in some future missions. So lots of exciting stuff is still to be done on Mars, and it's basically still the the missions in many ways are still the same. It's the hunt for life. OK, is there life still on Mars in microbial form? Um, was Mars was Mars very, very different in the past? What happened to Mars, um, et cetera, et cetera? And it's also a precursor for potentially going there ourselves. So the more we learn about Mars, the more we can determine whether or not or, or how um, human beings might actually be able to set foot on Mars ourselves. Um, now, there are obviously some conspiracies on Mars. Now, this is a famous one. Um, there's a face! There's a face on Mars! <laughs> um, and this image here does sort of look a little bit compelling. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a face. There's, you know, there's, there's Martians there. They've made a face and it's a message and it means something and, and stuff. We should all panic and put paper bags on our heads and things like that. Uh, no, alas, high res it, it's just, in this case, a, a trick of the light um, it, coming in from a certain direction. High res pictures of that mound show that no, there isn't a face. It's just a mound. Um, alas, you know, <laughs> the romanticism of Mars, you know, still captures the imagination. But unfortunately, they're all fake um, or they're all wishful thinking. Um, uh, there is a lots of fascinating stuff on Mars, but there is no um, Martian civilization. Um, you know, making making strange faces on Mars so that the Earthlings can get you know get paranoid about it. Um, alas, that sort of stuff isn't happening. <laughs> Unless, of course, this is what's actually happening on Mars. Okay, so this this could be true. You know, so actually, there's a beautiful city in the background. You know, the aliens are holding up high resolution placards in front of our probes to confuse them. So they're actually just taking screenshots of. <laughs> barren wastelands which aren't actually there so who knows i mean maybe i mean it's it's it's, it's possible right so this this could be the answer um <laughs> until we actually go to mars um that probably won't be disproved. in fact you know we know that these things will never be disproved by people who are you know, wanting to believe them because there's plenty of people who you know, think there's all sorts of conspiracies going on around us now and alas those aren't true either but hey they're good they're good fun so there we go um now um mars may have been very different in the past. We think that Mars um, started off much, much, much more like the Earth uh, several billion years ago. The problem is that Mars um, probably had similar amounts of water, uh, similar amounts of the original base chemicals that the solar system was composed of, as Venus and Earth did. Um, so it's extremely likely, and we see the evidence of that on Mars today, that there was oceans. Uh, there was running water, there was, you know, clouds and kind of classic blue sky, um, oxygen rich atmosphere uh, that we have on Earth today was probably on Mars three, three billion years or so ago. But unfortunately, Mars was too small and Mars's size is its biggest problem. It doesn't have the gravity to hold on to an atmosphere. And because it's a smaller planet, it cooled down a lot faster than, than the Earth did. 
And when the planet cooled down, its core slowly became more and more solid until today it's probably virtually solidified. It certainly isn't rotating separately to the core of the Earth uh, like we have on the Earth. And that generates on the Earth a magnetic field. And the magnetic field blocks pretty much all of the sun's um, uh, solar wind um, from hitting the Earth's atmosphere. Now that's a really good thing for us because uh, the magnetic field shields us against all sorts of stuff coming in from the sun, uh, which otherwise would be striking the Earth's atmosphere. And over millennia, and you know, actually more than millennia, millions and millions and millions and millions of years, billions of years in fact, the solar wind can strip away the atmosphere of a planet. Now the Earth has, a sh has this magnetic shield. Mars probably started out with one and then lost it. And the loss of that magnetic shield meant that the solar wind started stripping away the atmosphere of Mars. The pressure then of the atmosphere starts to drop. And if you've ever tried to boil water on at a high altitude, you'll know that it boils at a much lower temperature at an altitude than it does at sea level. And the problem with liquid water is it needs pressure to stay liquid. And if you reduce the pressure, the water starts to eventually boil and evaporate away. And this is what happened to Mars over a period of several, several million years, long, long ago in the past. So it started off quite like the Earth. Um, but slowly, over millennia, that water and that atmosphere gets thinner and thinner and thinner. The water is lost to space. Uh, it retreats. The weather gets simpler. You know, the clouds start to disappear. And the less atmosphere there is, the worse the radiation coming down becomes. Um, and, you know, the problem is like a, uh, is like a cycle. And Mars slowly... You know, sadly, there's this sort of romantic thing about, well, Mars was gorgeous three billion years ago, but it isn't today. Um, and Mars has lost its, lost its water as a result of this, this problem of not having the magnetic field that the Earth enjoys. And so slowly, Mars becomes this barren wasteland. The water um, evaporates, and all we're left with is a, a desiccated sort of um, carcass um, showing us what might what was once there and these are these are two cgi images of the same geographical landscape one with liquid water on the surface um, and a, a thick atmosphere and one without liquid water on the surface and a thin atmosphere and you can see how poignant this this image is is that this is on the right this is mars today and you know on the left is a cgi image of what mars probably looked like three billion years ago and you know it it, it was probably quite a nice place, um, yeah, much more so than it is today. Um, but the evidence that this happened is all across the Martian surface. Um, and it's like pointers, it's like archaeology, if you like, of, of the ancient Mars, um, which was far, far nicer place than the Mars that we have today. Um, so again, from space, Mars would have looked very Earth-like. Uh, it would have looked quite amazing. There are highlands and lowlands on Mars, um, so some areas would have been um, continents, some places would have been inundated with seas, and um, you can see that it was probably a very pleasant planet. Now the big question of course is, was there time for sophisticated life to evolve on Mars before the water was gone? And that's a question of course we don't know the answer to at the moment, but uh, it's hoped that these rovers that we're sending may be able to find some evidence of what, if any, life there was. Um, you know, there's a potential for fossils, there's a potential for you know, microbes to still exist in, uh, in the soil, hidden away from the harsh ultraviolet light that's still coming down from space today. Um, are there any relics of, of any potential life that was on Mars three, three billion years ago? We don't know. That's why Mars remains so fascinating today. It's a bit of a fossil, uh, but it had a much warmer and wetter past than, um, than it does today. And you know, here's a here's a lovely image of some 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 valleys on Mars that appear to have been um, cut by by running water. Um, they've got that lovely sinewy um, uh, flow that you can see that you know coming out from here. This is this is the highlands actually at the bottom of the picture, and the water appears to be running downslope up to the top of the screen. Um, you know, these these valleys appear to have been carved by running water at some point in the distant past. But you can see how old they are by the fact that there are craters on the surface, in some cases within the actual valleys themselves. That shows you that gives you an indication of how old these riverbeds are and how long they've been dry for. Um, 
and you know they, they're covered in craters which means they are ancient they were a long 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 time ago um, but you know it shows that there you know the evidence that Mars was covered in water is is very much evident in the the images we get from the surface Mars does have some fascinating things it hosts the biggest um, Unfortunately extinct, or maybe maybe good that it's extinct, but the biggest volcano in the solar system. This is Olympus Mons. Uh, it is truly vast. So to give you a sense of scale, Olympus Mons there is three times the height of Everest uh, on the Earth from the base of it. Obviously, there isn't a sea level on Mars, so measurement is slightly tricky. But if you imagine from the bottom of the Marianas Trench on Earth to the top of Mount Everest as a one, uh, this is three times that in height. In fact, it's so high at the top that it's virtually outside of the atmosphere of Mars. The atmospheric pressure at the top is pretty much a vacuum when compared to the surface of Mars. So it's a truly enormous volcano. Um, in terms of its size, you can see how wide it is there. It's, it's actually got the curvature of the planet in its shape. That's how, how wide it is. It's approximately the same size as France. So if you can imagine the entirety of France as a volcano, then that's about how big Olympus Mons is. Um, for the Americans, that's probably, I think, about the same size as Texas. So it's a pretty big volcano. Um, it's an enormous feature. Um, now that we think um, it, it's a shield volcano, and um, we think the reason it got so big is that Mars didn't have the plate tectonics that we have on Earth. So as you know, on the Earth, the continents move around very slowly. But over geological time, that movement is quite significant. Um, so our volcanoes don't get a chance to get very big because they move away slowly from the hot spots underneath the Earth's crust. We don't think that happened on Mars. So the volcanoes, when they erupted, they erupted in the same place for millions of years, spewing out lots and lots of stuff, and then eventually went extinct. So that's the reason we think the Martian volcanoes are so much bigger than the ones on the Earth. We don't believe there's any geological activity or uh, volcanic activity going on anymore, but of course we can't be certain. Um, but it doesn't appear that uh, Mars is tectonically or geologically active in that sense. Um, there's also um, uh, the Valley of Inaris. Now this is effectively a massive canyon chain on Mars. Now it's, it looks extremely dramatic from orbit. Um, oddly enough, on the surface, it won't look quite so good because it's so large that the edges of it will be over the horizon from the perspective of you on the surface. So actually, uh, whilst the Valles Marineris looks incredibly dramatic from space, on the ground it will look fairly dull because the ramparts are so f so far apart um, that you can't actually see them over the horizon. Uh, but it dwarfs the, you know, the nearest equivalent on the Earth, which is the Grand Canyon. Um, yeah, this is this. You know, if you put um, Ballas Marineris on the United States, it would go from San Francisco to New York easily and then some. So it is a massive, massive canyon. Uh, quite why it's there, we don't know, but it is an enormous, enormous feature which stretches effectively the length of the continental United States and a bit more. It's it's absolutely enormous. Um, but Mars is still active to a degree. This is a again a global surveyor shot and shows bits of Mars collapsing, you know, this is, a, this is an edge of an escarpment and, you know, there are landslides. Things shift and move on the surface of Mars and we think this is sometimes to do with the seasons because Mars does have seasons and uh, ice thawing, melting, um, you know, freezing again and loosening rocks and various other bits and pieces. So there are geological processes still active on Mars and, um, you know, these things are... Um, so there's stuff, there's stuff going on down there, and we don't necessarily understand all of it either. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, and obviously the Americans are planning to go back to Mars. Now there's a lot of talk about whether we can go to Mars as, you know, humanity can go to Mars. Um, and, you know, there's been lots of um, talk about this. Now this is a NASA slide where, you know, they're combining science exploration and technology and they're using things like Hubble, uh, the International Space Station and the, the new Orion probes and various other bits and pieces that they're collaborating with SpaceX to build up the technology we need to go to Mars. Uh, so the orbiters and the landers are sort of the precursors um, to you know, more commercial flights and um, you know, in-space habitats and maybe on-surface habitats as well. There are plans. Um, whether or not we get to see them in the next few years is difficult to tell, but um, there certainly are plans to go back to Mars in, in a big way and again continue hunting for, for life on the surface. We'll have to wait and see. And if we go there, it might look a bit like this. 
who's to say? But um, you know, these are the sort of things that we you know have. Um, looks uncannily like the uh, um, <laughs> that film <laughs> uh, where everything goes really, really badly wrong. So hopefully that won't happen. But um, um, you know, so you know, the Martian. But um, you know, this is the sort of um, habitats that they're they're thinking. This is obviously a CGI image, but gives you an idea of the sort of things that we might be able to achieve on the surface of Mars. Lots of problems to solve, not least the radiation. Uh, and unlike the moon, we can't just go there in three days and come back again. Um, you know, the launch window only opens every few months. So you're going to have to go there for a considerable period of time and be self-sufficient. So it's going to be a real challenge to, to get humans to Mars safely and you know, hopefully get them back again, one would assume. So um, that's quite interesting. Um, now, um, just for Steve, because there has to be a Star Trek slide in every astro astronomical presentation, as we know. So um, in the Star Trek universe, um, that Steve will, will doubtless be aware, I'm sure he is, that uh, Mars is the location of the Utopia Planitia shipyards where uh, many Federation starships were made, uh, including probably one of the most famous, which is the USS Enterprise NCC-1701D. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> that one's put in specifically for Steve, so I hope you enjoyed that, Steve. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, Mars is still with us in terms of science fiction stuff. Now, just as I come to the end of the Prezo, uh, one thing, this, this, this picture is, is taken by the Curiosity rover and uh, has no real scientific value at all, but it's here for a reason, because it just takes us back, perhaps, to a little bit of the lost romanticism of Mars that we, we've had to sacrifice. We've lost the canals, we've lost the princesses, we've lost, we've lost the crystal cities, but Mars is, as far as we know, the only planet in the solar system where, during the daylight, the sun and the sky is salmon pink, but all of the sunsets and the sunrises on Mars are blue and that's due to the dust so there's a slightly I suppose an element of romance in the fact that you could go to Mars and watch a blue sunset uh, rather than a red one so that would be something to see so surface of Mars sunset they are blue <laughs> so I hope you've enjoyed that I will hand back to my lovely hosts at Ashford Astronomical Society um, and um, thank you very much thank you very much for those of uh, you following in Twitch and on Facebook um, I hope you've enjoyed that and I will switch back to my my delightful host thank you very much